I'm going to call the meeting to order for the Iowa City City Council of formal meeting January 7th, 2020. Roll call, please. Burgess. Here. Mims. Here. Salee. Here. Taylor. Here. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. Weiner. Here. Welcome to your city hall, and we have a lot of faces out there that is uh, joining us tonight. So happy new year. Hope that your year is off to a great start. We have some new counselors um, for their first formal meeting. So welcome again. Yes, and we're going to start the year off with a proclamation for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Whereas the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a pastor, humanitarian, and leader in the American Civil Rights Movement during the 1950s and 1960s, fought for racial and economic justice and is lauded for his nonviolent approach to civil disobedience. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. devoted his life to the advancement of civil rights and public service, he believed in a nation of freedom and justice for all and challenged all to help build a more perfect union and live up to the purpose and potential of America. And whereas we are forever indebted to him for his contributions and therefore it is proper and fitting to highlight the life of a man who has such profound impact on changing an entire nation. And whereas Dr. King recognized that everyone can be great because everyone can serve, and during his lifetime encouraged all people to serve their neighbors and their communities. And whereas Monday, January 20th, marked this 37th anniversary of the nationwide observance of the Mar Luther King Jr. federal holiday, and whereas in 1994, Congress initiated the King Day of Service, a nationwide effort to transform the federal holiday honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. into a day of community service grounded in Dr. King's teachings that help solve social problems while focusing on bringing people together and breaking down the barriers that have divided us as a nation. And whereas the City of Iowa City, along with other sponsors, are holding a day of service on Monday, January 20th, it will include service projects from 9 a.m. to 12 noon at various locations in the community. After serving, volunteers will enjoy a celebratory program at the Mercer Park Gym, including entertainment performances, a keynote speaker, and free lunch. King Day of Service is an important day to encourage each other to take part in service that will benefit communities and neighborhoods and provide a fitting memorial to the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Now for therefore I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim Monday, January 20th, 2020 to be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day in Iowa City and urge our community to honor the memory of Dr. King to put his teachings into action by participating in the King Day of Service. Zachary Rochester is here to accept. Uh, good evening, Mayor Teague and City Councilors. Uh, my name is Zachary Rochester, and on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, it is my honor to accept the MLK Day Proclamation. It has been 57 years since the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, when over 250,000 people gathered in front of the Lincoln Memorial in DC to draw attention to the continuing challenges and inequalities faced by African Americans a century after emancipation. It was also the occasion of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Standing here in front of you in 2020, we all know that in this country, in this community, we have work to do to address and overcome the inequalities faced by African Americans. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. believed that a person's worth should not be measured by their color, culture, or class, but rather by their commitment to creating a better life for all by living a life of service for others. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of racial equality, understanding, service, and social justice is an inspiration to all of us in service to others as a bond that unites us and helps us to define a vision achievable by working for the common good. 
It is with this in mind that the City of Iowa City Human Rights Commission would encourage each of you to join us at Mercer Park Aquatic Center at 9 a.m. to, pers par to participate in the MLK Day of Service and Celebration. Um, for more information on events on that event and other events going on throughout the month um, in honor of this event or this holiday, um, you may visit mlk.uiowa.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary. It looks like you have some people here with you from the Human Rights Commission. Would, would you all stand to be recognized, please? Thanks for all the work that you do. You. All right, we're going to uh, the consent calendar. Can I have a motion to accept the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Salee. Discussion? Seeing there is none, roll call, please. Burgess? Aye. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. All right. This is the time in our uh, meeting where it is community comment, and we welcome individuals from the community to come up and speak on an item that is not on our formal meeting. We do ask that you keep the, the comments to five minutes or less. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Janes, Iowa City resident, and I'm going to uh, show a couple visual aids today. I'm here to talk to you about uh, the act of killing the deer in Iowa City. You authorized white buffalo to come in last year, and they've just finished up one of the rounds of mass killing of deer in Iowa City. And I wanted to show you some examples of their behavior, how they act, and what they think of this community, just to give you an idea of what's happening. Uh, let's see. So first of all, one of their kill sites was located within Oakland Cemetery. Everyone knows this place, it's beautiful, it's serene, a lot of people go there to relax and to mourn their loved ones. White Buffalo decided to set up a bait site to kill our deer within feet of people's gravestones where they go to enjoy the day or they go to mourn their loved ones. So this is a picture in the circle there is where that bait site was, where they set up to attract deer and then I'll show you later how they sit in their truck and wait for the deer to come by and shoot them. Again, these are hired guns that come from out of state and they sit there in the cemetery waiting for deer to walk by and then uh, from that truck with a gun mount, they aim at over the tops of gravestones. So you can see right there, they're actually shooting over the tops of gravestones to kill the deer that they can find that come to eat the bait. Here's the kill site for Hickory Hill, again, from a different angle from within the kill site. And you can see that, again, it's within feet of gravestones and the pathways through the cemetery. Um, I think it's incredibly disrespectful that they set up one of these sites here and just wanted to give photographic evidence of this. When they come uh, overnight, they kill the, the deer, as many as they can get within a night, and this is what they leave behind. So there's areas of blood that has been soaked into the ground. This was just going there one Sunday. Uh, a, a given Sunday after the killing had taken place, and you could see that out in the sunlight there, and just again within steps from the graves, there's these blood soaked areas uh, where they've killed these animals. There's bits of tissue and flesh left behind. There's blood splattered on the leaves there, and it's just all rather disgusting. Here's a close up of one of the uh, one of the killers that that was that is hired. They sit in their truck like this and they just wait for deer to walk by. These are not honorable hunters. These are not, um, I would say, uh, men of good repute. They are sitting there and waiting for deer to walk by so they can shoot them in the head. They're out of state. We've seen license plates coming by through these areas from Montana, from Connecticut. They don't know our city, they don't respect our city, and they certainly don't respect life. I'm asking you to ask them not to return in February for a second round of mass killing of our deer. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And thanks for signing in and stating your name. 
Hi there. My name is Matthew DeForest. I live here in Iowa City also. That's actually my wife. Hello, Matthew. Yes. Hi. Uh, and uh, yeah, I uh, came to the meetings uh, when this was being discussed, and I was just really surprised that it was agreed that it was going to carry on. Um, uh, this is what I found in Terry Trueblood Park. Uh, this is within 200 feet of a bait site. Uh, they had shot these deer. Uh, the one on the right has an obvious uh, bullet hole in its head. They didn't even collect them. That was within six, eight feet of a walking path. And this was in broad daylight. Uh, the, who knows, probably the next day. Um, but so again, this is just the way that white buffalo seems to be behaving. And, uh, you know, I would just appeal to your reason. I don't understand how this was approved. Uh, there was no science behind it. There, it speaks volumes that White Buffalo is the only, only company or organization that does this, and they travel all over the country. If this was actually an effective method, it would be uh, a boom industry. But deer populations are controlled not by shooting every deer. There's, if there's deer in Johnson County, they're going to be in Iowa City. If you want to shoot them all every year, that'll work. But it, the carrying capacity and eliminating uh, food sources, people fencing their yards, not planting things that attract deer and make them thrive and have more babies. Uh, when they're killed like this, they are going to reproduce exponentially. We're going to, if they continue doing this, there's going to be five times as many deer in five years as there are, you know, when they're done. They, there's real science behind it, and none of that has been brought up. In any of these meetings I've come to, there's been public comments with people who have degrees in other areas, but there's been no studies done. The only study of deer population was done by White Buffalo, who is the only company that shoots deer for a living. It's, it just isn't reasonable. Uh, if, if there was, you know, a real interest in, in a sustainable way to deal with the deer and live with the deer, then that would be money well spent. Hiring people to come and shoot deer out of the back of their truck, the only thing missing from that photo is the six-pack. It's ridiculous. That's Oakland Cemetery. Beautiful place. Um, yeah, so I, I very much hope that uh, the council would reconsider uh, having them back here and at least take them to task over this sort of behavior. I mean, I wasn't out looking for dead deer. We were out looking to see what was going on with the bait sites, and it, was, it didn't take very long. They shot them and just left them there. So anyway, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah. So. Thank you, Matthew. Mayor, congratulations. Thank you. And council members. I'm Lori Crawford from Iowa City. This photo is really, I'm kind of out of order. Somebody else is going to speak to the fact that they weren't allowed to have salvage tags on the deer that you just saw for the reason that there, there were no antlers to retrieve and that the body wasn't able to be eaten. This was a deer that died in my yard, um, and you can see where his antlers came off. Excuse me, where the little round thing was is where his antlers were. They came off a few days before he collapsed in my yard. This was a bow shot deer. But my point is that I was allowed to have a salvage tag. And he, um, let's see if I can do this. Allison, is there? Yeah, right arrow. Okay. Whoops. <coughs> Oh, I don't want to use my time. Anyway, um, he was emaciated there in the next photo, which I can't show you right now. The, um, you can see the infection, and um, it took him, thank you, about six weeks to uh, die after he was shot by the arrow. But again, my point is the salvage tag was permitted. Um, the second point I want to make is, it's okay to, oh, there it is, yeah, yeah. So you can see how emaciated he was and that I still I was allowed a salvage tag. I'm concerned about um, the secrecy and the limited involvement by the Iowa City Police Department. I consider these to be safety issues, public safety issues. I was told the city doesn't have a list of private property where deer are being baited and shot. 
I consider this to be a public safety issue. The city thought it was important enough to list for us the parks, the cemetery, and the University of Iowa listed areas where the deer were going to be killed, but we aren't allowed to know the private properties. I'm wondering if public safety is only, only matters on public property in the University of Iowa, or whether we have concerns also on private property. I'm also concerned that tax, about, I don't know the answer to this, but if taxpayer money is being used for the sharpshooting on private property, I think we have a right to know where that's occurring. I think the city should know, and I think citizens should be permitted to know. As far as I've, I've been told, Iowa City Police Department isn't supervising the people that are using the weapons inside city limits. I was told that they're told every day where White Buffalo is going to be doing the killing. They're told the general vicinity. They aren't even told specific areas. So I don't know how the police can police these people if they don't know where they are. The city also has no knowledge of the names of the people who are hunting, killing I should say. They don't know their background checks. They don't know if they've um, done proficiency testing. Yet these people are free to bring weapons and use them in our parks, cemetery, and neighborhoods. A felon was permitted to hunt in Cedar Rapids because he wasn't properly vetted. He was removed from the hunt when I reported him. We have shooters moving freely into our parks, cemetery, and neighborhoods without police supervision. That seems very concerning to me from a public safety issue. My third point is killing in parks is going to drive deer more into residential areas. So I predict that you're going to be getting even more complaints from people about deer in neighborhoods. Early on, I suggested that we set aside parks and green areas as safe places for deer to reside as a way to move them out of residential areas. So the step that we're making right now, I predict will move them back into residential areas. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Hi, Lori Kendrick. Congratulations, Mayor Appreciate Teague. It. Thank you. Good to see you, um, Lori. Yeah. So, as you can tell, the consensus among the animal welfare people is that Dina Cola um, shot deer at Cherry True Blood and left him there. From the beginning, I have, if there was going to be deer killed, I stood firm that I would rather have them sharp shot than bow hunted. So my knee jerk response when the deer were found on the weekend of the 7th of December was that it wasn't Dean Nicola's deer. So I called the Iowa City PD and of course they wanted to go retrieve the deer and I said not until we're there with you because at this point we don't trust the officials. Everything's been done with a lack of transparency. Everything has been to protect the killing of the deer, to not be fair for the people that are concerned, that are just wanting to, to know what's going on with this project. And furthermore, what's gonna happen when bow hunters come in. So, it was a week before we could get out there with the police department to retrieve the deer. At that point, they bagged the deer up and took them to animal control. Immediately, I requested salvage tags for those two deer. I was told by Erica Billerbeck with the DNR that yes, I could have tags as soon as they were finished with the investigation. So I called back daily, and nobody knew what was going on. Then Erica said, no, Iowa City PD would issue the tag. So I contacted them, talked to Bill Campbell. He said, no, um, Sheriff's Department. Called Johnson County Sheriff's Department. I talked with Sheriff Adolph. No, that's DNR. So I was right back full, cir full circle to Erica. And she said, well, we're still trying to figure out what happened there. But as soon as it's everything settled, you know, you're the first personal contact. Yes, you can get tags. 
So I kept calling and ended up that the DNR picked the deer up from animal control and decided, oh, they're so decomposed at this point, there's nothing to salvage, so no, we're not going to issue you salvage tags. Furthermore, we have no idea whether the deer were shot or not. If they were shot, maybe somebody else shot them and brought them into Terry True Blood. And the entire thing is a fiasco that nobody knows what happened to those two deer, where it happened, when it happened, why it happened, how it happened. And this is a supposedly tightly organized professional project. So what's going to happen when we have amateur bow hunters just everywhere in town? An 18-year-old can go buy a bow and arrow and go pay his ticket to kill a deer. He can't drink a beer when he's done to celebrate it. Why? What's going on here? And why is it being so protected? Why don't we know what happened? We don't deserve that. And private property hostas are more important than a family on a, on a fun outing to see nature at Terry Trueblood or Hickory Hill or a loved one at the cemetery to visit their deceased loved one? We don't get a trigger warning. Splattered blood, guts. We don't get that. We don't have that benefit. But that's what we get to deal with so that somebody's hostas are protected. Please reconsider. Thank you, Lori. Hi, my name's Carol Rocco. I live in Iowa City. I'm not a public speaker. Uh, I wanted to comment. I was with Allison and Lori at Terry True Blood on the 21st, and we went out to see those deer. And uh, the one on the east side of the trail had been decomposed, but you could see that there was an entry wound on its back. The one on the west side of the trail that was by the river uh, you could see that there was a bullet hole underneath its right eye. And when the uh, police officers came out, um, I, I believe they recognized that. We, we, we talked with them about that. Um, and uh, it was a clean, you could see it. You could see the exit, oh, excuse me, the exit wound. Uh, I find this uh, whole thing completely emotional and I don't understand why it's happening. And uh, I don't believe that this is serving the public. I believe this is serving a special interest group. And uh, I hope you uh, reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, good evening, Council. Good evening. Mayor Teague. Uh, Hello, Brandon. And uh, welcome new councilors. Uh, you certainly have big shoes to fill. Uh, I believe Jim Throgmorton had size 12, and <laughs> Rodney Cole, I think, was about a 14. So good luck. Please state your name for the record, please. Brandon Ross. Um, yeah. I'm here at the beginning of the year to, uh, to propose that the city focus and focus hard on a couple of issues that I, I feel are major. They're national, they're global. Uh, one is uh, naturally global warming, and uh, the other uh, is uh, equality, uh, which I think should be a major thing in the forefront uh, of our city. And uh, I had a friend who uh, is in nursing school, and uh, 
he's been going to nursing school and he lives out of his van. And I said, why are you living in your van? He says, well, he said, uh, Iowa City uh, is unaffordable. And I think that affordable housing should be a major thing that we should focus on for this year. So uh, global warming, I mean, we hear this every, every day. We've got things. We have to move faster than we're moving. We are doing things in the city, but we have to go faster because it's coming faster. I would say a couple of other things. Uh, you know, Adam Smith is considered the father of, uh, of uh, capitalist economics. And uh, he believed that if there could be a free market, that there should be a free market that was free of... Uh, of monopolies and uh, also of landlordism. Now, he didn't believe that there'd be zero landlords, but you know, he, he thought that that would go by the wayside. And I think that in our, our town, uh, landlordism is, is something that has to be dealt with. And uh, I think that if you're a capitalist or a socialist or something else, I think it's, a, it's something that we know. Um, he also used this expression once in uh, his book, Wealth of Nations, which was the invisible hand, uh, which is often abused by economists who believe that the invisible hand meant that just let the market do everything, everything be cool. But he didn't mean that. Uh, what he meant was that when the market failed, as it would probably do, he didn't think it would be perfect, then provisions would be made for the poor and the aged and the handicapped and the injured, and that there had to be an agency for that. And that agency is you and the rest of us. Uh, so that he believed strongly uh, that, that a government would be in place, uh, not just everybody just goes wild. So again, and I would just, in the same uh, vein, I would mention that uh, another great economist, Carl Polanyi, who wrote the book, uh, The Great Transformation, had said that if everything is in the market, even the environment, if the environment is commodified as to made something that could be bought and sold, he said, eventually the environment will be destroyed. He wrote this in the 1930s. So I would say to the city council uh, to focus on these two areas. One is the equality and helping people who are working class, poor, uh, who may be older, uh, artists. Uh, I spoke to a friend in San Francisco, and he told me that the music scene was dead there. And I said, why is the music scene dead? And he said, because the landlords ate it, OK? We have festivals here, which is great for the middle class and everybody, but do we take care of the artists on the ground and provide affordability so that they can create and have expendable time and expendable energy and expendable money? So I bring these points up uh, because I think the council has a job to be a buffer between capital, which is always bearing down, Capitalists want you to do what they want. They want to build buildings. They want to make money. They want to do everything. And the people who make up the vast majority here. And as I look here, I want to say this is really something that we have five women on the council and two men. And I believe that's the first time that's ever happened here. And I just want to congratulate you and the city for, for having this. And I really believe that women uh, are great communicators, better than men. I haven't often think that in the police force, the women should be the only ones to have the guns, the <laughs> only ones. And the men should not have the guns. They should work on their communication skills. So I just want to say, welcome to the council 2020. Let's have a great year. And uh, yeah, work on inequality and uh, global warming issues. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Hello, council. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Vanessa Fixmo Arise, and I had correspondence in your packet, but I thought I would just read it if that's okay. Will you please sign in? I will, yes. Awesome. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah.
Okay, so my name is Vanessa Fix My Rise. I'm going by V these days, but I'll state that for the record. Um, so I am chair of the Housing and Community Development Commission, and uh, I've been really honored to be in that position. I've really enjoyed the commission. Um, and I just wanted to read this letter, uh, so I'm just going to read it. So dear council members, I'm writing this letter as a narrative companion to the memo sent, staff sent regarding our request to a joint meeting. As you know, the Housing Community Development Commission, HCDC, has been working with staff and agency representatives on reevaluating and adjusting the aid to agencies funding process over the course of the last year and a half. We are striving for three goals. One, to adequately and consistently fund our human resource agencies. Two, to provide a clear, transparent, and fair application and selection process. Three, to align city council's goals in the city steps consolidated plan with the funded services our human resource agencies provide. In the recent memo sent by staff, you'll note that there have been a range of budget requests from the Agency Impact Coalition, AIC, which I think several of you are familiar with. Um, all of the organizations have come together. Most of them have. Um, please note that these must be taken within context, these numbers. Uh, this past summer and fall, uh, I was fortunate to be able to attend two meetings held by the city manager and his staff and AIC representatives. Um, and during the course of the dis these discussions, a variety of factors were discussed, such as the larger timeline and budget the city works within and the budgeting process for each department, which was very helpful. The AIC representatives were able to voice challenges that specific agencies are facing, such as a growing at-risk population and disinvestment from state and federal funding sources. While these meetings were enlightening and informative, one issue has loomed large and remains. How much funding is enough? That's something you're probably familiar with. The AIC includes several agencies, and they have worked hard to ensure that each agency is accurately representing what they need. Much like any budgeting process, this negotiation period requires a bit of back and forth between agencies and communication with city staff and the commission. Hence, the HCDC does support the final budget number that the AIC requested at our last December 19th meeting of $675,000. Um, I would also like to remark on the person-to-person -person relationships that the Commission has been fortunate to build with our human resource agencies. Several times this year, we have, ex we have experienced people in the room talking about valuing our agencies beyond the numbers and budgetary figures we encounter every year. These people, our people, are providing essential services by saving lives, creating more dignity in our town, and making Iowa City and Johnson County the vibrant, equitable, and diverse place we all want it to be. And for this, we are filled with gratitude. I am deeply appreciative of the work that city staff and city council members have invested in, provide, in improving the aid to agencies process and funding source. And the commission looks forward to discussing this at your earliest convenience, which I hope to have that discussion later this month um, or at your earliest convenience. So thank you. and. Um, and congratulations again, everybody on there. Thank you. This was a part of our V, this was a part of our consent calendar and earlier discussions with council and we um, have agreed to meet with ACDC. Cool. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is impromptu, but what the hell? You'll have to state your name. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Megan Alter, and congratulations to everybody at the 2020 Council. Very excited for this, for you all. Um, I just want to take this opportunity, both as a member of the HCDC and then also the South District Neighborhood Association, to um, put forth a general comment and a general plea that um, Council and the various commissions attend to the needs of the South District. It's a vibrant place. It can use more support. And especially with the news of Amazon coming in, I think that there is real opportunity for um, neighborhood betterment and community building that can really help the existing residents as well as people who are going to be coming to work there as well. Um, there still is a retail desert there. Um, even while we do have grocery stores, there needs to be better transportation. There's going to be many people who are going to need to get out to the warehouse, right, who may not have a car. As we are also trying to figure out climate change action, we don't necessarily want a lot of cars up and down. Amazon, as it is, is going to be 
creating some more of that vehicular traffic. So I just encourage council to sort of think of this holistically. I know that through budget discussion, there's been a lot on looking at the whole picture. And so I just want to remind and ask council to consider the South District as a part of that, um, because I think that there are some very key ways that helping bolster that area of town can really further your strategic plan. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. And there is no one else. All right, we're going to end public comment. We're going to move on to item number nine, planning and zoning matters. And this is 9A. And this is rezoning American Legion Road. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 35.29 acres of land located north of American Legion Road and east of Eastbrook Street from county residential R zone to interim development, single family residential ID RS zone to REZ 1909. And this is second consideration. I have a motion to um, give second consideration. So moved. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? Just a reminder to, to maybe to our new counselors and to the public that this is just to an interim development, um, so it'll have to come back again for another rezoning uh, before anything is actually built out there. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. T? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Item 9B. Zoning code amendment related to utility scale ground mounted solar energy systems. This ordinance amending title 14 zoning related to utility scale ground mounted solar energy systems, ZCA 1905. And this is to pass and adopt. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Salee. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Item 10, Spruce Street Water Main Replacement. This is a resolution approving the project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the Spruce Street Water Main Replacement Construction Project, establishing among amount of bid security to a company, each bid directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. Password. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly I'll help you. Joe Walter, I'm with the Engineering Division and uh, have a short presentation on this project, uh, which is to occur on uh, Spruce Street over by uh, Sycamore Mall. Uh, the intention is to replace existing six inch uh, cast iron um, pipe with a new eight inch PVC pipe. It's about 900 linear feet of pipe. The existing pipe is 1950s and 1960s pipe. It has a history of breaks. Uh, we are using trenchless methods to um, limit the amount of surface uh, dis disturbances. So there'll primarily be uh, three pits along, along the way and most of the rest of the way will be done um, with smaller connections of the 23 houses that are served by this. Um, the new services will go through the, the right-of-way, so uh, up to the edge of the right-of-way, the, each of the 23 services will be replaced. 
Uh, new ADA compliant ramps will be put in on the west side, uh, the projects on the west side of Spruce Street primarily. And so that, that area will be getting new ADA compliant curb ramps. You can see the uh, general schedule that we're doing here. So um, we intend to open bids uh, with the council's approval of the project manual tonight. We intend to open bids at the end of January, start construction at the beginning of March, have a substantial completion date at the end of April, and a final completion date at the end of May. That corresponds, end of May, corresponds with the seating deadline. Um, the Opinion of cost is roughly $280,000. And for those that are in the public that are interested, uh, the um, design was done by Watersmith Engineering out of Muscatine. Uh, Brad Roth is the president of that company. His contact information is up there. My contact information is also up there. Any questions for me? Do you know how long this project will be going on until it's done? How long the construction will be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically beginning of March and okay. still end of May. And is this going to interrupt the service for the residents around the area, or how does this work? <clears throat> so we have, uh, we have the westbound lane will be closed. Uh, the eastbound lane uh, will, will still be open and allow access, local access for the residents. There will be detours. Um, I actually do have a slide on that. There will be detours around um, mm -hmm. using uh, friendly pine and deforest for, for residents to get a, a, around that. Sycamore Street is right there on the east side of this as well. Sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Anyone else from the public would like to address this topic? Seeing there is none, we're gonna close the public hearing. Move resolution. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Thomas. Thomas. Discussion? Roll call, please. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Yes. All right, item number 11, McAllister Boulevard, Gilbert Street to Sycamore Street improvement. Resolution approving a project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the McAllister Boulevard extension project, establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid, direct the city clerk to post notices to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipts of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. Now I have to figure this out. Can you repeat louder, please? Um, I'm Melissa Klo. I'm with the engineering division. Hello, welcome. No. go. Um, I'm working on the McAllister Boulevard Extension Project with the Engineering Division. Again, my name is Melissa Klo. Um, this is a quick overall um, aerial of the project. It will include new construction from Covered Wagon Drive to the existing Sycamore Street Roundabout. Traffic signal installation will occur at the intersection of South Gilbert and McAllister. 
Um, improvements include new sewer, water main, fiber, and street lighting to serve future development. Um, street lighting, permanent street lighting will occur at Covered Wagon as well as at the future Russell and Armstrong intersections and improvements at the Sycamore Roundabout. We have two twin, twin culverts installed to provide drainage um, through the existing property and then a 10 foot wide sidewalk on the south that will connect the regional trail network. Um, up here is the typical section. We have a 100 foot right of way with the addition of a 20 foot center median. This median was added uh, based on conversations with the consultant that's working on the form based code for the south district. We have 11 foot vehicular travel lanes with potential for future street parking when development occurs. We have a six foot bicycle lane between the travel lanes and the future street parking. A six foot sidewalk on the north and the previously mentioned 10 foot sidewalk on the south. Trees will be planted with the project in the median and in the parkway they will be planted at the time of development. Here's the plan view. Um, we're developing full intersections at Armstrong and Russell for future connections during, um, during further development of the property. Um, we have future right of way shown. Um, you can see it over on the right for future right in, right out neighborhood connections. Water and sewer connections at these Full intersections will be extended to the right of way for an easy connection during development. And then the future parking areas are also dashed on the north and the south, and they will be located between the storm sewer intakes. So those will act sort of as bump outs and buffers. Um, we also have a field fence at the request of the property owner at the south that will be installed at that right of way. For phasing, we'll construct in two phasing plans. We'll begin at the east with the new construction on McAllister from Covered Wagon towards Sycamore. Um, starting in June, we'll have a complete closure between Gilbert Street and Covered Wagon. Uh, we have the existing roadway out there. Um, about a third of it has some cracked panels that we will be replacing and we will be taking advantage of that closure, closure to connect to the existing expand um, out to our new section. Pedestrian vehicular detour will be provided at the time. And then as far as estimated costs, um, construction costs is about $4.3 million for a total cost of um, just under 5.2. Um, the schedule uh, it's been in design for a little while. We had anticipated construction this past summer, but due to the South District form based code, we revised that section and worked with that consultant. Um, we're completed with acquisition, and our bid letting will be at the end of this month with construction beginning in April through the end of November. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Melissa. Is there anyone else that would like to address this topic? Seeing there is none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve the resolution? Move to approve. Seconded. Moved by Salid. Seconded by Burgess. Discussion? I was a little surprised to see the mention of the traffic signal at Gilbert Street. I, I know we just recently, um, not too long ago, put the four-way stops there, which seems to have helped to control the traffic. Have, has there been issues, or is there a reason we would go to signals then? I think we put the stop signs in as an interim measure 
Okay. <clears throat> there were some concerns. We had a, a rezoning proposal there a few years ago that failed, and there were some concerns raised during that rezoning about traffic controls there, and we had mentioned that this project was coming up with um, the prospect of signals, uh, but the council and the public didn't want to wait that long, so we put the stop signs in right, as an interim right. measure. Okay. Well, we had a letter earlier this evening from a resident on Langenberg, so this, this really is going to be the, the remedy to the, um, the through traffic that's currently running through on Langenberg, so I think we're all looking forward to seeing uh, the construction of McAllister, so this is a major step. And um, <clears throat> this extension will be kind of the, one of the main corridors running through the South District with uh, mixed use proposed uh, at the corner of McAllister and Sycamore. So that's, that's part of the form-based code concept of creating a, a neighborhood commercial center uh, in, a, in that way that we often like them, which would be more kind of pedestrian oriented. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this project completed and then the eventual development following the form-based form code that it will serve. Yeah, I think the community's waited for a long time for this. I'm, I'm not convinced it's going to be, I wish it was going to be the solution to Langenberg, but I think with the, when this was presented as an arterial street and it going more to um, a collector type thing with a 25 mile an hour speed limit, I'm, I'm not convinced it's going to be the solution. I'm concerned we're going to continue to see the problems with Langenberg because it's going to be a little bit more direct route to where people are going on some of the east side. So, but that's what the council's decided, so we'll see. Okay. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Yes. Item number 12, repeal <coughs> rental permit moratorium. <coughs> Ordinance repealing ordinance number 19-4793, a temporary moratorium on new rental permits for single family and duplex units. First consideration. Move. Second. Moved by. Sally. Sally, seconded by Mims. <laughs> Discussion? Did you want to have any, allow for public comment? There is no public comment. Um, we can do public comment. So I'm going to open public comment. It's not a public hearing. Oh, it's just public, oh, just yes. public comment. Yes. All right. Um, my name is Bruce Ayotte. I'm in Lynn Street, Iowa City. Uh, so I spoke last time a little bit more about my uh, specific situation, and uh, we're, we're still working on that. Uh, I was hoping to make some uh, uh, general comments, perhaps provide feedback from my perspective to, to how things went. Uh, the uh, first is when uh, I look at my neighborhood, it wasn't placed there uh, by some deity and we all happened to stumble in, let's say like a forest or whatnot. It was built up over time by a lot of little people doing little things. And that's why even compared to newer developments that aim to mimic it, let's say like a peninsula neighborhood, doesn't capture the, the essence of, of that uh, of, of this community and of the uh, uh, urban layout. Um, we have uh, stately homes uh, in close proximity to much more modest homes, and those all occurred because of a, a much more organic process. And that came about, as I, you know, as I said, by little people doing little things and taking care of that neighborhood in which they live. Uh, the uh, ordinance uh, that are being developed to address some, you know, legitimately and serious concerns. Uh, I'm afraid have the uh, uh, effect of a spider web in which uh, little things get caught and all the big things get through. Uh, you have individuals who, uh, or entities who have, uh, um, who work on it full time, can get around your ordinances, and if they can't, they can hire a lawyer. And if that doesn't work, they have the ear of the legislature. And that uh, a very preventive uh, defense only approach, I'm afraid, is not going to keep uh, my neighborhood as vibrant as it can. You really, I think, 
need people who, uh, for whatever reason, have developed a deep affection for the place and want to put their own resources and their own uh, energies uh, towards that. And so when you uh, uh, consider your regulatory systems uh, to keep, keep that in mind, because um, I'm not sure that that's come. You see a problem. I've been there in my own line of work, uh, and you hyper focus on something, and that issue becomes, and that example becomes the dominant, all, you know, and, and it's a sort of a one size fits all. Um, in terms of things that are uh, a little bit more concrete, one of the remedies was the uh, uh, parking, and I understand where that comes from, but I think it's an example of um, uh, the kind of homogenization in terms of your, your mental model of, of the neighborhood. Uh, even compared, you know, if I go into, I, I have a dog, you know, walk my dog, drive through the Peninsula neighborhood, despite the efforts of the uh, uh, developer to create diversity in the housing in that area, uh, lot configurations are very standardized. They're very FHA oriented. In the north side neighborhood, these lot configurations are not homogenized. And so you can go in, you can say, well, we're going to put a limitation nine feet here, nine feet there, four feet here, whatever. And that's wonderful. And, you know, for the most part, it'll work. But it'll cause perhaps problems that a uh, more straightforward solution might not. Or maybe, and even with straightforward solutions, you have hidden assumptions, you have to think of that. In my own field, I'm a mathematician. Uh, we refer to things as elegant solutions. Uh, computer scientists have the same notion. In this case, uh, there's something that, you know, various new urbanists here and there like to use uh, parking maximums. It strikes me that a parking maximum would have gotten to the, the quick of the issue. When I read the descriptions, the issue was, oh my God, we have five, five cars here, four cars here, six cars here. Well, if if underlying, if the problem was there's too many cars on people's front yards, you say, well, don't park five cars, you can only park two on your front yard. And will there be situations where people really shouldn't even have two on their front yard? Well, yeah, but I think you've now cut down the number of egregious issues small enough and you have a regulation that isn't going to cause problems for uh, individuals whose lot configurations are maybe not uh, what was modeled in your head when you wrote that uh, ordinance. Uh, so again, I hope you vote to repeal so that those of us trying to uh, invest in our neighborhoods can go forward and do so. Um, but also as you go forward with these uh, regulatory structures to think about uh, uh, the effect on people whose full-time job is not to figure out how to get around them, but are rather trying to do the best they can within the rules. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Nancy Carlson. I live at 1002 East Jefferson. And I'm not very good at getting these labels off. <laughs> Good evening. I am asking that you limit the number of bedrooms in single family detached houses to four in the RNS 12 zone. This is the number allowed in single family attached houses and in duplexes. Although apartment buildings can no longer be built in our neighborhood, I call attention to the fact that where they are allowed, three bedrooms is a limit per unit. Regulating the number of bedrooms seems to be a normal occurrence. We have experienced a lot of redevelopment in our neighborhood. I call your attention to the map that I have given to you, which details many ways of increasing density while being compatible with the structures and densities in our neighborhood. As all other types of rental units have a limit on the number of bedrooms allowed, I don't believe asking for a limit of four bedrooms for single family detached houses is unreasonable. Instead, it helps provide a playing field that both the developer and the neighborhood understand and respect. Please support placing limits of four bedrooms for single family detached houses in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Also discussion? Well, I'm gonna support 
lifting the moratorium. I think our original um, intent was to have the moratorium until uh, staff had had an opportunity to come back to us with any solutions or new regulations or issue, you know, changes that we could make. That's been done. Um, I think at the original time, I know at least a couple council members wanted the moratorium only six months, and staff, I think, wanted 10, and we compromised to eight. Um, we don't have anything before us at the moment that will make a regulatory change within the next few weeks, and so I think we should follow that initial direction, and that is to end the moratorium now that we don't have anything imminent in terms of changes. Yes, uh, I think, you know, if we talk about the rental cab itself, it being done by the city and the council uh, to do this. But since uh, last spring, uh, you know, the city has been prohibiting from doing so. And also we did this so the, the city can come up with another solution to help everyone. But uh, last time I encouraged to defer it because uh, people still like, uh, come to me and send me emails and saying that there is some solution we have to look into it And I thought people would come up with like really solution for this and we give them the chance I I, I just see that the, the city now try to do a lot of things um, from the red on testing to the single-family Side development. I, I think some the bark and regulation and all this this is will help uh, reduce uh, you know, the fear for the people, but I, I just think that it is time and I will go ahead and support the, uh, the rebuild. Well, I just want to try to briefly summarize, you know, what took place since we started listening and hearing this issue. Um, back in December for the new councillors, I did prepare a uh, memo to the council uh, suggesting, in a sense, what I think Bruce was referring to, the, the notion that as I began to look at it uh, more deeply, it seemed to me that trying to re rely simply on regulatory frameworks to achieve the outcome we were after was not going to accomplish our goal. Uh, trying to prevent, in other words, something from happening rather than what, and what I tried to explore in the memo was how can we promote what we want? What is it, what is it we want? What are the obstacles to achieving it? And, and trying to develop a more comprehensive program to that end, which may include, and I suspect would have to include, more than re a regulatory framework. <clears throat> and so that was the content of the memo, and I hope, you know, Laura, you and uh, Janice have an opportunity to look at it. I still believe that if you look at any neighborhood revitalization program in historic neighborhoods, they typically have an array of features to them to try to promote that revitalization. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I did reach out to um, Bruce, didn't make contact with Bruce, he was out of town. Um, but um, I also talked with Thomas and, and you know, I, I, I'm hoping we are, the potential impacts on, on Bruce and Thomas uh, will be resolved over the, the next month. The, you know, I will be supporting this tonight. Um, but I did in the uh, interim look at the uh, codes for Ames and Cedar Falls, which are the two kind of equivalent, uh, met with staff to discuss them. Uh, it is interesting to note that both those cities have ordinances which have a, more, a, a greater restriction on the level of occupancy. However, the issue is that Eleanor feels that uh, those ordinances have some concern, she has some concerns with them, which she expressed uh, at, at one of our more recent meetings. So, you know, we are, uh, we are in a situation where we will be without what conventionally in university towns are the two methods of controlling uh, the degree to which neighborhoods have uh, student rentals, and those would be the occupancy caps, which we had in the, in the past that were then replaced by the percentage cap. So those are typically how uh, some measure of control is exercised. We don't have either. Um, and so my concern was with 938 East Jefferson that you know the, the, the fine tuning and changes to the regulatory framework that we're working with had not, in the end, 
resulted in a situation where we weren't seeing high occupancy, uh, in this case, a high occupancy addition. So, so as I said, I will be um, supporting this. I still have concerns about what might happen. Um, uh, you know, it's there, I think staff and I were, uh, had, had different views as to what might happen. Um, as far as I can see there, we just don't know. And we'll have to, and I, you know, I would ask that we monitor the situation um, uh, because it is a fragile one. And uh, so I, I think we just need to see how the current, current controls we have in place, how effective they are, um, and respond as necessary to what we see happens out you know, in the future. Um, but for now, I'm in support of, you know, repealing the, the moratorium. I was originally not in support of repealing, so I said we set a date of March and we should stick to it. But now so much time has passed, and by the time we get through the readings on this, it will practically almost be March. So I, I will be in favor of going ahead and repealing it. Uh, and to John's credit, uh, I believe he, he did offer some suggestions and offered some very good suggestions, and I respect his urban planning background and the research he's done on this. Uh, obviously, controlling rental numbers is uh, something that deserves uh, ongoing discussion discussion uh, by the council, and uh, we'll have to continue uh, getting thoughts on, on this issue, but I, I will be in favor of repealing it. I think that our hands have been tied to some extent. Um, I really applaud staff for all they have done to, to, to really attempt to get a grip on this situation. Um, I, I applaud you, John, for what you, have, what you have brought forward. I agree that we need to that we should re repeal it for now and keep a close look and see then what can develop in the future. One thing that's been apparent to me watching this process from the outside is that I think staff and council are on the same page um, with the majority of the neighborhood as to what we want to happen. And so being able to be proactive on the things that we can influence and control I think is really important. And when we're faced with something that um, isn't you know, helpful to or is harmful to particular property owners. And we have the data from staff showing how other regulatory changes that we've already implemented seem to be improving the situation. I'm in favor of repealing the mor moratorium also. I am as well. And I think um, to all the residents within this community that has voiced concerns for us to hold this. I think many of them understand where we are as a council and, and our inability to, um, to really create uh, some things that can meet some of their needs. But this really is about the neighborhood and preserving it to be a neighborhood. And also ensuring that everybody is welcomed in this neighborhood. Um, homeowners, uh, renters, um, they do include students, and so I think that's very important for us to, you know, kind of state and um, that everyone within this neighborhood is uh, is welcome. There are some things along the way that I think um, may be, become a burden in the neighborhood and we're going to be faced with, and I think that's the time where come together, let us talk about it, let us figure out ways to um, create a solution in the moment. I, I do applaud John for his work um, and his research in bringing items to council uh, for us to consider. I would say, you know, don't stop now. Let's continue to figure out uh, some things that we can do as a council. Um, and it doesn't have to be regulatory. It, it could be, you know, um, something different that uh, we can even, you know, begin to just um, as a concept to those developers or those landlords or even homeowners um, to consider when they're purchasing properties in that community. So I will vote to re repeal this tonight. I, d I just want to end by <clears throat> thanking all the, uh, in, um, um, those who gave their thoughts on this to Nancy. Nancy's been <clears throat> working in the, her neighborhood for 40 years trying to preserve its character. Um, so thank you to, to Nancy. Uh, Sarah uh, Barron, I also wanted to thank her for meeting with me to talk about strategy, the strategies for how we can view the core neighborhoods as an opportunity for affordable housing. Um, uh, I, I, I'd reached out to the affordable housing 
coalition years ago, and I think Sarah was really took it very seriously, and um, you know I, I really appreciate the support of the the board of uh, the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition for uh, supporting the the effort to try to. Uh, provide ways for affordable housing to happen in the central neighborhoods. Great. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion to accept correspondence. So moved. Seconded. Moved by Mim, seconded by Salee. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item number 13, approval of the 2021 to 25 consolidated plan. This is a resolution adopting Iowa City's 2021 to 2025 consolidated plan known as City Steps 2025, authorizing the city manager to submit said plan, technical corrections, and all necessary certifications to the unit, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and designating the city manager as the authorized chief executive officer for the consolidated plan. Could I get a motion to move to approve this? So moved. Second. Moved by Mim, seconded by? Weiner. 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 All right. Discussion? Tracy Hyshu with Neighborhood Development Services. I am the JV tonight. Our Neighborhood Services Coordinator <laughs> had this presentation prepared. <laughs> the doctor went home with flu, so you got me. Oh, okay. okay. Um, if there's anything I can't answer, I will get that information back to you. Uh, but Erica was great. She prepared this before she left. <laughs> So um, our consolidated plan for housing, jobs, and services to low-to-moderate income folks, uh, we call it City Steps, is a five-year plan. It's how we allocate our federal funds. We estimate about $1.1 million a year. Those funds have to be primarily used for people under 80% of median income or in your census tract that, that, that are eligible for, we call it LMI populations. <laughs> um, this is a plan that would take us from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 25. There was a huge citizen participation process that we do every five years. We hired a consultant, Mullen and Lonergan Associates out of Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania. They take us through that stakeholder involvement. They go through a needs assessment, market analysis, strategic planning process. They did a survey of our public, um, our agencies regarding public facility needs. They come up with a plan. Um, this is just the series of public input that was involved, and we have two HCDC members here tonight, too, that went through the process as well. Um, the City Steps is a great way where we, we consider what our priorities, how we're going to spend our federal dollars over the next five years. So the priorities for this upcoming five-year period is the creation and preservation of affordable housing in both our rental and sales markets, um, housing and services for persons experiencing homelessness, public services for these folks, the non, or sorry, non-homeless LMI persons. Um, we always have public facility improvements that serve these populations and economic and workforce development initiatives. Um, we, like I said, we get about 1.1 million a year in our resources for CDBG and home. Our set-asides, our council set-asides that you approve that people don't have to competitively apply for. So we have that 15% for public <coughs> services, and actually we do have a separate allocation round for aid agencies. We have 75,000 that was in the last plan reserved for neighborhood, um, neighborhood amenities such as park shelters or sidewalk improvements. This will be used to help us with our climate action initiatives, and I believe for fiscal year 21 we're going to um, look to see to how many trees we can plant in areas that lack tree canopies in our low to moderate income census tracts. We do have a housing and rehabilitation, those dollars that we uh, we rehabilitate about 30 homes per year. We changed that 90,000. We still have that home set aside, but we expanded that to, to landlords. So if they want to improve their properties, it won't just be for owner-occupied households, that landlord, landlords can, can apply for those funds as long as they're assisting people below 60% in median income. We changed the set aside for CHODOs, um, those community housing development organizations. HUD rules require that 15% of our home entitlement must be used to um, benefit CHOTOs. Um, in, in Iowa City, we have two. They're the Housing Fellowship and HACAP. So we already have to reserve 15% and it has to go. If we don't allocate our money to a CHOTO, then the, we just don't get those funds. And so they, 
Iowa City doesn't have access to it. So we're going to take that from the competitive pool, and now CHOTOs can apply until we've committed the funds. Now, if they want to apply for more than that 15% set aside, then they'll have to come through the regular application cycle. Um, we have 50000 to support economic development initiatives. That will be in our funding for two years if it's not used. Then it'll, go, it'll free up for public facilities or housing applications. And then there's admin dollars. And that admin dollars pays for whatever surveys or um, plans that we need, such as the analysis to impediments to fair housing. We use our admin to pay for Mullen and Lonergan to do the consolidated plan. Um, and then just for staff salaries to, to support the programs. Some of the additional changes that we'll, you'll see in this five-year plan, we've been talking a lot about the aid agency process. Um, in this plan, we, we took out those, we identified those legacy agencies over that five-year period. Those will be the only agencies that will be able to compete for funding, for legacy funding. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to get the same amount throughout that five years, but those are your applicant pool for that five years. If you want to add an organization, then we'd have to go through it. Uh, we call it an action plan amendment. Um, and then we, re we plan on reviewing those every five years, because every five years priorities or different challenges emerge. So every five years you'll be reviewing those agencies that are allowed to apply for legacy. Um, we still have that set aside for emerging agencies, so every year they'll compete. So if there's an agency that doesn't qualify legacy, they can still apply for emergency funds with our regular allocation fund. After you approve the plan tonight, um, we will start with our fiscal year 21 application process. So we'll open up the applications probably next week. Um, public facilities went from a minimum of 50,000 to 30,000, our preference. Um, we instituted that I think the last five years ago. It's to get our agencies to start looking at their, their larger needs for capital improvements. Um, for, for several years we were getting, we need new carpet for $5,000, we need a new bathroom for $10,000, and we really wanted agencies to start looking at how do we make an impact with the, the limited federal dollars we get. So, <coughs> so we still have that preference for $50,000, but we'll allow applicants to apply for $30,000. There's also a bunch of policies that we have with it that are unsuccessful or delayed projects policy, um, our, our citizen participation plan. Administratively, we had those piecemeal. They came to council or HCDC at different times. Now we've just consolidated, updated them, and they're all part of the city steps plan. So it's, it'll be helpful to us because that means they get updated every five years and they're not scattered. So people who are getting the money will understand what policies um, are relevant to them. HCDC asked us to include money or language on mobile homes, so we'll clarify in that plan that mobile homes are eligible housing type, and we do housing rehab on mobile homes. Um, the homeless table, you did see there is a late pet information that we received, um, a late handout from a lot of our service providers, especially homeless service providers, and they asked for some technical corrections. And so we can do that administratively, as long as it doesn't change the intent or it's nothing substantial. So we just got those today. Um, so we will, if it's an edit on our end and it doesn't change substantially, we can make those edits. Um, do you pass those out or do they just get them? Okay. okay. All right. So next steps. You have the public meeting. You. You can approve it tonight, you can tweak it, um, but we do need to for proof, so, so we have this process that we go on where we get applications, we review them, we have to get our plan to HUD 45 days before July 1st, so everything is back down, so it's a pretty tight schedule from your approval until we allocate the funds. Um, February 1st will be, will be the date applications are due, HCDC will review in March. You'll get that plan, we call it the annual action plan that lays out how we're actually going to spend the money for fiscal year 21. That'll come to you in May, and then we have to get it to HUD by July 1st. They go through their process with congressional approval, they approve it, and then we start spending the funds. Um, the only thing HCDC recommended that wasn't incorporated into the plan was HCDC did recommend with our owner-occupied housing rehab to limit beneficiaries to 60%. Staff was recommending to keep it at 80% for several reasons. Uh, from fiscal year 18 through the first of fiscal year 20, we've completed 60 projects. 73% of those are for people below 60%. The rest were for people between that 60 to 80%. Um, people at 80% still, I believe, needs assistance. So we looked at those people at 60 to 80% that had work done that we completed. Several were emergency projects as well as mobile home repair. If our job is to stabilize neighborhoods and that's where modest homes are, 
that I believe we need to keep that ability to assist people at 80%. Um, for example, if you're a single mom with two kids below 60, 80%, you have a roof repair and windows for 25,000, it is gonna be hard for you to afford that. And so our pro program provides that assistance to stabilize our neighborhoods and to keep our modest homes in good condition, safe and healthy condition. So that, so the recommendation is to keep the 80%. If you wanna move it to 60%, you just have to make that recommendation and we'll, and we'll change it. All right, any questions for Tracy? I, I know I have some, but John, go right ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I thought you were leaning forward. Well, thank you for presenting. I think you did good. <laughs> um, so the priorities, I really appreciated hearing about the affordable housing for rental and owner-occupied. Um, when it comes down to the legacy agencies, I understand that for five years, you know, if you're in the, if you're a part of that pool, then you'll remain a part of that pool. But in regards to emergent agencies, do they switch to legacy agencies? No, every five years be evaluated. So when we go through this process five years from now, we would look at those legacy agencies and we decide with HCD's recommendation, if we want to remove one, add another one, or if we just want to add another one, they would determine that and that, that would set it for the next five years. And the emergent agencies, is that only a, how long can, can you remain within the emergent agency? As we have set it up, you could continue on as emerging agency, but you'd be reevaluated every five years, and then it'd be up to HCDC and the council to move an agency if you wanted to. Okay. Um, the problem we've had with ongoing, when we keep adding agencies to those legacy, it water it filtered down to the pot, and then you then you see those agencies who have historically gotten funding, and and they rep. They're all doing good work, um, but you're going to see those agencies who have been relied on, who have been relying on forty, fifty, sixty thousand. When you keep adding the amount of agencies, they keep getting watered down to now they're getting 25 30,000 and that's when you see them coming back and expressing frustration just because when the aid agencies was set up is it, it was supposed to be like a fun a stable funding source for those agencies that we rely on to provide services to primarily low to moderate income folks so it's kind of a balance of that it's it's providing funding stability for every five years but allowing us every five years to reassess our priorities and determining what agencies should be included and which ones can still apply for emerging. I don't know that I'll ask you to give any names of agencies that want to be in the legacy, um, but do you have any example, well, just some oh, any sure interest by individuals that want to be in legacy that aren't? Um, no one has called me expressly say that I want to be a legacy agency, but I'm sure they have to be because, I mean, if I was an agency that wasn't getting funded through legacy and I could uh, get into that pot of funds and get 15 grand, I'm sure there, I'm sure there's agencies out there that would like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you're good. Thank you, Tracy. All right. Council discussion. Oh, we please come up. Yes, yes, yes. I've been asked, V, fix my eyes. Um, so I've, as a chair, I've been a part of this conversation for quite some time, and I really appreciate that you brought up the emerging and the legacy. This is something that we've really gone back and forth with uh, quite a bit because we really do value and recognize that our legacy organizations have been around for 30 or 40 years and you know are really seeing the squeeze from you know federal and state funding depleting and the need only only rising um, over the last few years uh, and, and really even over the last few decades uh, quite honestly but um, to answer your question about the emerging funds so or the emerging uh, organizations we really looked at you know we, we want to be able to support new things, right? That if there are new needs in the community that aren't being served by, you know, kind of those legacy organizations, how can we help uh, give them a leg up? And so it's actually not a ton of money. Um, it's really just enough to kind of cover somebody at like, I think it was like 15 hours a week for, you know, minimum wage. Because we realize that these funds are very important because they're also, um, you can use them for operational expenses. And uh, so it was just to really kind of give those organizations or um, ideas really kind of a, a seed money to just see how they would 
do. Um, and we had some really great applicants. We had um, like Solar, Solarize Iowa City. Uh, we've had some really interesting, I think particularly because climate change is such an issue, you're really starting to see um, organizations start to form and uh, try and try and do their part too. Um, so, but to answer the question about like the, f the five year, how do you become like a, a legacy emerging kind of uh, thing, we, we saw that as, as those emerging organizations started coming and applying for funds, um, if they were awarded um, and could show that they were stable, then we thought in five years that would be enough to say, oh, you know, maybe we could then consider uh, weighing, you know, our legacy, adding an, another organization or, you know, changing things out. But so it's, it's not black and white at all. It's sort of a kind of a clear as mud thing, but I think that we're really trying to balance and respect the work that's being done in the community. I know that there's been some, uh, some folks have expressed, you know, uh, because there's such a small pool of um, legacy, or such a small pool of funding in some sense, to really get a lot of this work done, they, a lot of legacy agencies just they want to make sure that everything's coordinated. So if there is a need in the community, maybe there's an opportunity to coordinate with an organization as opposed to creating a new organization. So that's, that's something that was sort of unexpected that I didn't really uh, foresee. But anyway, I hope that answers some of your questions about emerging versus legacy. It's a little bit squishy, but I, I think that this will at least give folks some time, some five years, to feel like they're having some set funding and at the same time recognizing that new needs come up in the community all the time time. So hopefully we can help them out a little bit. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thanks, V. Anyone else from the community? Council discussion? It's an incredibly comprehensive report that, that, that for me really pointed out some of the some of the areas of continued need that I think actually coincide very well with some of what council is focused on up until now, and give us a, additional focus and direction going forward potentially. I mean, it's good. I think it's good to have had this enormous amount of community input, uh, and it's a valuable document. I maybe do have a question for you, Tracy. Other than the um, question of the 60% versus 80% LMI eligibility, um, do you believe that the changes that the organizations request in these late handouts are of that technical nature and it's yeah. not a problem yep. for us to move forward tonight? From what I read through, it was like on page 108, change this definition to this, or so I think, yes, they, I think they would qualify as administrative. Okay, thank you. Did you see them? Yeah, I think when I, I looked at them, yes, they looked administrative. And the changes, Tracy, also included uh, more language or more in-depth language, including about mobile home owners. And From what I understand, it was to clarify that mobile homes are a type of eligible activity um, and that they provide affordable housing. So I think we can do that. Good. Any thoughts on the 60 percent versus 80 percent I would encourage you we keep it to 80 I, I think as Tracy explained like over 70 percent 73 percent that they're doing it to go to those people below 60 but right. there's occasions that you get a few people in that range and you don't want to not be able to assist them if necessary I mean I, I think with the vast majority of it going to people below 60 it's clear that that's where the emphasis of staff um, is in awarding those funds, but to give that little bit of flexibility, I think is always good. I agree. I would hate to see someone end up out of their house because they couldn't afford a relatively minor repair and they're at the level between 60 and 80%. All right. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Urgus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion to accept correspondence? Wolf. Moved by Salee. Seconded. Seconded by Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item number 14, council appointments. 
Um, so we had 14A, Board of Adjustment, one v vacancy to fill a five-year term, January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2024. Uh, discussion. No gender requirement. There is no gender requirement for and this one. only one person applied. <laughs> Yeah, and only one That's person applying. It was interesting there was no gender requirement since there was one female and three males on there, but we have the one applicant and uh, he had been on it for just a short time before but had to leave for the service, so I would be in favor of, of appointing him. Bryce the issue is Parker, we're, past the gen we're past the date on the gender. Yes. There was a gender oh, right. requirement, but right. we're past right. that right. date. But not so. now. Right. It was after 12. Yeah. Right. December is here. Yeah. I'm fine with Bryce. Yeah. Okay, and we'll probably, as we've done in the past, kind of go through uh, 14B and then um, just All make one vote sure. at the end. So uh, 14B, Senior Center Commission, two vacancies to fill a three-year term, January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2022. Um, there is, and I'll combine these if that's okay. Oh, yes. And Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2020. And there is a... Gender requirement, one female, one male, and one non. Okay. I, I really wanna appoint George Nelson. He been in Iowa City for 45 years. He been active member of the center since 2008. He taught different programs uh, like in, uh, for the past three years at the center and uh, I guess he's really will be a good add to this uh, for the mail. I'll, uh, I would like to support Paula Vaughn, who uh, I think has done extraordinary work on the Housing and Community Development Commission, and uh, I'm just really impressed with the work that she's done in the community. I agree. She's uh, she's been very active also on the League of Women Voters. She's uh, dedicated and reliable in, in everything that she does, and uh, I would recommend highly recommend her. The the one, you know, I think we, I think we've talked about this a little bit before. Um, so there are three female applicants. So um, Linda has only has been in <laughs> Iowa City for 36 months. And then Glenn has been in Iowa City for two years, but Paul has been here for eight years. Eight years. And so uh, uh, typically we've always kind of based our, some, some portions of our judgment on if they've had an opportunity to serve on a board or a commission. Paula certainly has, um, but given the three applicants, I think um, my mind goes to um, um, supporting Paula to be on there for various reasons that's already been stated. Um, and then I um, would also um, propose Linda, even though she's um, been here 36 months, I, I'm just reading some of the things resonated with me and I know that um, she has also uh, been in conversation with Latasha with um, a real desire to be a part of the Senior Center, but um, that is kind of my recommendations. Well, I support those two and George as well. Mm -hmm. Then the question is which one is filling the unexpired term and which two are taking the full terms? I had Paula and George as the two three-year terms and Linda serving and filling the vacancy in the unexpired. It's fine with me. Yeah, sir, okay. it's fine with me. All right, can I get a motion to appoint uh, um, as John Did. just stated. <laughs> so move. Second. Moved by Celise, seconded by Mims. Is that for both the Board of Adjustment and the Senior Center? Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. Annou uh, item number 15, announcement of vacancies previously stated. Um, Parks and Recreational Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2020. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, January 14, 2020. Airport Zone and Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term, January 1st, through 2016 through December 31st, 2020. Historic Preservation Commission, 
one vacancy to fill a three-year term July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2021. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term effective upon appointment through June 30th, 2021. Vacancies will, will remain open until filled. All right. Um, we uh, are going to go to item number 17 because item number 16 typically has always been community comment if needed if we didn't get past the 8 p.m and it's and our student is not here yes and, and they're not here tonight yes austin we miss you um all right we'll go to number 17 the city council information um we'll also um do any boards and commissions yes you can add that here as well if you have anything and I think we'll start with our Mayor Pro Tem, <laughs> Maza Here Salee. Okay, I, I don't think I have any like commissions that I want to report on. And also, I don't think I have anything to report on. I pass. And I'll go to the right. So we'll go this way. I also have no boards or commissioner meetings to report on and no community information. All right. Uh, continue the trend. I have nothing to report on right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say I'm really excited for my first ICAD board meeting on Friday and my first <laughs> UNESCO City of Literature meeting next week. Oh, really? That's you already had one. Okay, good. <laughs> um, nothing on the commissions. I, I would. Uh, I, I did want to mention uh, Maeve Clark's retirement. You know, in the recent past, on the 20th, that was a wonderful event. Uh, Glad I had a chance to make it. And um, on the 13th, Ike had, uh, I, I, the Iowa City Downtown District, not Ike had, the Downtown District, uh, is sponsoring a, an event at Big Grove from 6 to 7.30 titled Building Neighborhood Districts from the Ground Up. So, um, you know, on this topic of neighborhood development, um, that might be of interest to those who would like to attend that. Um, Jack has approved their budget for the coming year. That's the only thing I've had in terms of boards and commissions since our last meeting. So they're moving forward on that. Um, just kind of wish everybody a happy new year. And just uh, while this is not new news, I, I just want to take a minute because it had a lot of had connection with a number of people that we lost in the last yeah. few weeks. Um, as many of you know, my husband spent 37, 38 years in the University of Iowa Athletic Department, and we lost um, Bump Elliott and Hayden Fry in December. And, you know, as I thought about that and sitting here on city council for the last 10 years, um, while we've always had the university here, a successful athletic department in the Big Ten makes a huge difference in the city. Um, makes a huge difference for the university. It attracts a lot of people to that university, both students, faculty, et cetera. And if it weren't for Bump Elliott and Hayden Fry, the University of Iowa Athletic Department would not be what it is today. Um, Bump came here after incredibly successful time as a student athlete at Purdue and is at Michigan. Um, he was an assistant coach, and he, then he coached at Michigan um, and came here to be athletic director. And then, of course, two or three years after coming here, um, hired Hayden Fry. Uh, we lost Diane Finnerty. Um, I'd known Diane um, off and on for a long time and, and just a wonderful, wonderful human being that um, gave an awful lot to this community. And um, Jerry Lowenberg, who was the dean of the Liberal Arts College at the university for a long time. So um, I know there's plenty of other people um, that did wonderful things in this community and across the country in the last year. But those are the just four that, that just kind of hit me in the last month that we've... <laughs> As we were going to some of these, my husband and I looked at each other and like, uh, we're next. <laughs> all these older, you know, all these older folks are going. So I just wanted to just you know, kind of give a public acknowledge acknowledgement to those four who have contributed so much to to the university um, and to the community. And other than that, to wish everybody a, a happy new year. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, and I would agree to. Um, Bump Elliott and uh, Hayden Fry, the work that they've done, and to all the other ones that have passed on before. So thanks for all their work here in Iowa City, and it's been very appreciative. 
Um, I did have a committee meeting uh, with the assessor office, um, Brad Comer, yesterday, um, and we did his evaluation as, as well as um, go over the budget and that type stuff for that department, and so that would be coming before council um, to be finalized as well. Um, other than that, um, as far as commissions um, or committees that I'm, I'm a part of that has taken place, there's a few things coming up that I'll reserve until afterwards, and then I'll bring it back. Um, the one thing that I did want to make mention of is um, I made a mistake and stated that um, I think I said that this was the first woman majority council, but this is the first five <laughs> woman majority council. There was um, a woman majority council before really? where there were four. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I wanted to make sure that I made that public correction. The other thing is I know that councilors have received um, from Jeff Mayor um, an invitation from the Mayor Innovation Project. And so I wanted to make sure that I just uh, mentioned that. Um, that invitation is for all councilors. Uh, the city of Iowa City is a part. We have a membership with the MIP, and I do plan to go. And if you um, do need to have more information on that, you can certainly see me or Jeff uh, about it or go to the website. I did attend last year with Mayor Throgmorton. It is open to mayors and city council individuals. Um, it was, I found it to be very beneficial just as a counselor. And so definitely I think if anyone wants to go, uh, you can certainly um, connect with Kelly because um, she is the one that makes it all happen. And uh, so I just wanted to talk, you know, make sure that I mentioned that about the Mayor's Innovation Project. And um, if anybody. I guess I, uh, I, I think I had an email from Jeff saying that we can talk about it here, right, if we want to go. I reply to give that. I really would interesting to go, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Sure. Where, where is it being held? Washington. Washington, D.C. Washington, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so anybody is welcome. And um, so, all right. We'll move on to city staff reports. Just a quick thank you to you all for what, three meetings in five or so days, including a really long one on Saturday. Really appreciate it. Um, you don't have to come back here for a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to go. <laughs> Uh, I'll have two reminders. Uh, one is the census is coming. <laughs> um, April 1st is Census Day. Uh, we are continuing to prepare with uh, our regional uh, group, and everybody is continuing to work hard at getting the word out. Um, and we'll give you more information as, as it comes. Uh, the second note is just that uh, we had our second meeting of the Climate Action Commission as a full group. They're working together very well. A lot of really great discussion that'll be in the minutes for your upcoming uh, review. And uh, they did their first overview of the 100-day report, which seemed generally positive. Like I said, it's a lot of good discussion. Nothing. All right, so motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, oh, I did, and they, oh. they, they said no. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm just, all right. just some nodding of heads. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry about that. So um, moved by Mims. Second. Second by Salee. All in favor say aye. Aye. And we are adjourned. Aye.